It's the Maxwell Institute Podcast. I'm Blair Hodges. Martin Luther believed the Bible proved that the Catholic Church had gone astray. His efforts to bring reform to the Church wound up leading to his own excommunication, and the Reformation was off and running. In the previous two episodes, we heard from Craig Harleen and Brad Gregory. They talked about Martin Luther's life and the Reformation more broadly. In this episode, Jennifer Powell McNutt talks about the Bible during the Reformation. If Protestants believed that the Bible was the best source of doctrinal truth, they were still left with the problem of how to read it, how to interpret it. For example, the Bible didn't solve all disagreements among Protestants about church sacraments like baptism, marriage, and ordination. Jennifer Powell McNutt is an associate professor of theology and history of Christianity at Wheaton College, a Protestant school with a Christian student body. Jennifer and I spend a little time talking about what it's like teaching at Wheaton and how Christian history can sometimes unsettle people in their faith. What's it like studying about Christianity in an academic setting as a Christian? This episode is the final one in our series about the Reformation in conjunction with our conference, The Living Reformation, 500 Years of Martin Luther. The conference was a big success thanks to everybody who came out and joined us. Videos of Jennifer Powell McNutt's presentation and presentations from other guests will be available on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. And on the podcast, we still have interviews coming up with Lori Maffley Kipp and Grant Wacker, two scholars who also participated in the Living Reformation Conference. Stay tuned for those. But right now, it's Jennifer Powell McNutt on the Bible in the Reformation. Send questions and comments about this and other episodes to me at mipodcast at byu.edu. And please, if you haven't already, take a moment to rate and review the show in iTunes or leave a comment on our Facebook page or tell a friend about the show. Jennifer Powell McNutt, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be part of this. And we're looking forward to having you here at Brigham Young University this week. By the time people hear this, you'll have already been here, but uh, I look forward to meeting you. Thank you. I look forward to meeting you. And we're here talking about the People's Book. This is a book that you co-edited about the Reformation and the Bible. And let's start off with King Henry VIII, right? Before he declared himself to be the supreme head of the Church of England in 1534, he was aligned with Rome and the Catholic Church. So he wasn't really a big fan of Protestant literature. Henry comes onto the Reformation stage and he is really heralded as the defender of the faith by the papacy. He's responding to Luther's treatise on sacraments and the Babylonian captivity of the church. And he is showing himself to be a, you know, a good prince of the church at that time. And then he's going to make a shift uh, over what's called the king's great matter. <laughs> and he's going to shift in his allegiances. And like you mentioned, the act of supremacy, he's going to um, what Luther will later describe as, as really become a pope in his own right, in his own context. And um, so something that the book highlights is the fact that, you know, as the um, head of the church, it is Henry's prerogative and right to distribute the word of God to the populace. And he, you know, he, of course, does that. It kind of trickles down right through his ministers, his chief ministers, his Archbishop of Canterbury, and it trickles down to the people. But Henry is kind of a difficult one to peg down. And in, in most ways, probably he does not fit what uh, Protestantism is looking like at that time. And in fact, um, he's going to really push back against Protestant theology very clearly in um, 1539 with something called the Act of Six Articles. And there he's like, I affirm transubstantiation. You know, I, I affirm the celibacy of the, of the priesthood. Um, lots of markers that indicated a more Protestant allegiance he, he's going to push against. And so when he speaks to Parliament, then in 1545, he talks about the Bible as this most precious jewel and he expresses his concern that, you know, there, the conversations about scripture are happening in some of the most profane places like the tavern and the alehouse. And, you know, he's in a way communicating then his desire to pull the Bible back from the people. So our book really wants to, to highlight, you know, this is the people's book and here's Henry VIII giving the Bible to the people and then 
taking it back from them. And so that's part of the complexity of what it means to try and study Bible history in the Reformation period. And it seems like Henry really saw himself as a central figure in this. I'm thinking about Mm -hmm. um, the Great Bible is the the Bible that he authorized that came out in 1539, and it had a frontispiece there, and it wasn't decorated with something like an image of Jesus or (laughs) or anything like that. It, it 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 was the king. That's right. Yes, exactly. Um, So Hans Holbein is the one who did this frontispiece for him. And, you know, I really appreciate the work of Reformation scholar Richard Rex. I I really have benefited from his thinking on this. Um, He's at Cambridge. And, you know, he highlights how Henry's depictions, royal depictions change over time. And, you know, whereas once he sort of wanted to be perceived as the, a Solomon, you know, of, of wisdom and aligning more with the Renaissance humanism. And then we see it shifting. And here he is, you know, the head of the church and he's he's actually passing out the Bible. And in this Brennan's piece too, it defies what were some of the common practices of the time. So it would be something that people wouldn't miss, that the picture is doing something different than in the tradition of frontispieces. What was the place of the Bible before he split in Catholicism? Um, You say he he felt like largely he was continuing Catholicism himself, just with himself Mm. as kind of the the Pope. Yes. (laughs) How did Catholic views of the Bible affect what Henry then did with the Bible? Well, you know, I think it's an interesting history because you have William Tyndale, again, coming out of the Renaissance humanism, this desire to, to take the Bible back to the original languages and then translate it into the common tongue of these different regions. And, you know, so William Tyndale is going to do that for England first um, after, you know, traveling to Wittenberg and and being influenced by Luther. And um, so it's, it's fascinating then to watch the opposition to Tyndale's Bible. But then, in fact, you know, every Bible has a lineage and this... Tyndale's Bible was was absolutely essential to as a foundation for the Great Bible. So it's like you know this Bible is okay, you know, because because Henry says it's okay, but you know Tyndale's Bible is not okay because <laughs> it uh, it stands as sort of too too rebellious, perhaps of of a book. And and each of the Bibles have their own reputations. You know, um, it's one of the reasons why James wants to replace the Geneva Bible later with the you know the King James Bible. Um, it's you know. You know, pushing back against um, certain groups. And so there's lots of politics uh, going on behind the stories of Bibles, which, which I find really fascinating. So the other factor that's important to keep in mind is that what we really come to realize is that Thomas Cromwell and Thomas Cramner are, are absolutely critical to what's unfolding. And, you know, as different people fall out of favor, so, so Cromwell really falls out of favor in 1540. With the um, king in particular. With the king in particular, it, it leads you to conclude that he's really the one pushing for the requirement that each parish church have a Bible uh, in the church. You know, this is something that would be like chained to the lectern. <laughs> it's a very valuable um, mm-hmm. book. And um, what's interesting to me is that when you look at the publishing statistics is that in 1541, then there are no more Bibles published in England during Henry VIII's reign. So Cromwell, you know, falls out of favor. And then we see this rapid decline in in the availability of this particular vernacular Bible. So... Did Henry regret making that Bible available then, the Great Bible? I think his comments at Parliament in 1545 (laughs) do indicate that he regrets it. You know, it was a big deal to say, you have permission to read the Bible privately in your home. And, uh, you know, there's... uh, there's kind of a, there's a lack of trust, and that's been a concern in the medieval church for a long time. I think he reflects his context in that regard. You know, even Cramner is going to say, read but don't reason um, when he talks about people reading the Bible. So, 
in this context, and then I'd say probably in other contexts and regions of the Reformation as well, there's a desire to still guide the interpretation that's happening in the encounter of a, a lay person with their biblical text, um, and to make sure that, that they're not going beyond the bounds of what the church has interpreted to be appropriate. So that's the sticking point. <laughs> right. And it doesn't seem like it's just theological, right? I mean, you have yes. the king's not up here saying like, golly, right. I, I hope that someone doesn't have the wrong idea about this particular doctrine. I mean, Protestant literature and Bible interpretation could be threatening to the king even. That's right. That's exactly right. It's interesting to keep in mind that in the case of England, that we really do have the empowerment with with the Protestant Reformation, you have the empowerment of the political ruler um, rather than a, a revolt against the political ruler. And like you would you see in some other contexts. And so it's very empowering to him. And then, but, you know, now the buck stops with him. So it's just, it's really just a shifting of, but still sort of a, a mono focus on who is in charge. That's Jennifer Powell McNutt. She's joining us today from Wheaton College, where she's Associate Professor of Theology and History of Christianity. And we're talking about her most recent book, The People's Book, The Reformation and the Bible. Jennifer, in your contribution to the book, you have a chapter in here, and you're talking about the topic of sacraments. And you say that sacraments during the Reformation era is like a Gordian knot. So, <laughs> Unpack that metaphor first of all. What does that metaphor mean? And then we'll yeah. talk about how it applies here. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, you know, of course, every metaphor can break down, but the way that I mean <laughs> to use it is, um, you know, in in colloquial expression, a Gordian knot is just it's it's very complex. It's it's so difficult to unravel that you you really can't do that. And I think that there is great complexity between how word and sacrament intersect and then how the reformation uh, period is uh, discussing this um, understanding that connection and there's you know there's divergence in different contexts um, but i also think that it's it's a helpful metaphor because you know as the legend or the story goes um, alexander the third comes across the Gordian knot in the temple of Zeus. And there's this prophecy that, you know, if you can untie the knot, then you'd be the conqueror and ruler of Asia. And, you know, he, it's just, it's too complicated. So he simply cuts the knot. And it's, it's very interesting to read some of the reactions to that. And I see a parallel with, I think that the reformers see the medieval church as Alexander the third in a way that the medieval church has cut this knot between word and sacrament and that the knot itself is really a God ordained tie that should not be unraveled. So that's really what I, I mean by it. And then how that plays out, I think is really just the way that the disconnect that emerges in the, and again, I'm talking about the critique of Protestants at the time, but this concern over a disconnect that has emerged between the participant in the sacrament and the actual, the efficacy of, of the sacrament and its promise. So, you know, looking to Luther, for example, I like to say, you know, his first thesis and the 95 theses is it's about repentance you know he he declares in that first thesis in opposition to indulgences that you know the whole christian life should be about repentance so I, he is concerned about the heart of the believer and that that heart um, as and then i'll say that the mind and the soul <laughs> that that every part of the being of the of the person the participant is engaged with what they are doing um in receiving what god is offering through the sacraments so the heart of the participant becomes the focus rather than you know basically doing the administration of the sacrament correctly and so there's a few reasons why they're going to change different aspects of the worship service. And, and I'll just say one of the most important ways would be introducing 
you know, vernacular liturgy, so liturgy in the common tongue, because Protestants are, are trying to, to argue that it, it actually really matters that the people that are participating in worship know what's being said, that they hear the good news of the gospel, as I say, you know, um, proclaimed what Christ has done on the cross, that they, they hear that and that their heart can be prepared to receive, you know, the elements and that through that, then the Holy Spirit is at work in transforming the believer. And so ultimately it's really, <laughs> it's really the Holy Spirit that determines the efficacy of the sacrament. So that's what I'm trying, I was trying to get at what's an image that we could explore that can be an umbrella for all the different complexity that's going on with sacraments in the Reformation. And let's talk more specifically about what those were and, and what role they played for the medieval church. So this is on the eve of the Reformation, yeah. there are seven sacraments that kind of take the Catholic from birth to death. What are these seven sacraments? Yes, yeah, exactly. Just like you said, I mean, it's it's the whole life of the believer is marked by the sacraments, by these seven sacraments. And the medieval church, it's important to keep in mind, gains clarity on the number of sacraments, um, you know, really not until Peter Lombard in the 12th century. So with the flourishing of Western scholasticism and theology, medieval theology at that time, you know, that's really when the church begins to clarify that there are seven sacraments. And then that will be affirmed by the Roman Catholic Church again in conversation with Protestantism at the Council of Trent in the mid 16th century. But up until that time, you know, there was kind of different lists and, and that sort of thing. But I love how the medieval church talks about two of the most important sacraments, um, the first being uh, baptism. And, you know, scholastics would describe baptism as the first plank against shipwreck. So we're thinking about sin, original sin, and, you know, what's the first plank against shipwreck? Well, the, that first plank is baptism. So, and that is, you know, infant baptism, the, the Catholic Church practices for Christian families, the children that are coming out of Christian families, you know, and then the second plank against shipwreck is penance. And so we have then, you know, how I think the medieval church is, is dealing with a really important question, which is how do we deal with sin after baptism? And so penance is, is critical to the life of the believer in that context. And then, well, as part of a penance that you could do would be the Eucharist or the Mass. And, you know, as a, a child who's growing up in the church, you want to be confirmed in your faith. So you go through a process of confirmation where you make your faith your own. And then you might, for example, decide to get married. So you get married or, and or, <laughs> um, depending on how your life goes, uh, you might take a vow of celibacy. So this is your ordination as a, as a monk um, or, you know, in monasticism. And then finally, as you are, are passing away, the church facilitates the, you know, last rites, which is also called extreme unction. And that is really your last communion um, to prepare your soul before your death. So Luther is getting at the issue of penance, and one of the ways to satisfy, feel sorry for your sins, then you would confess your sins, and then you satisfy for your sin. And one of the ways that you could satisfy was through the purchasing of indulgences, and, and in fact, you can still do that in the Roman Catholic Church. And so he was critical of a what he would describe as a corruption that was happening in the medieval church over indulgences. And that really, that's a huge part of what opens the floodgates for just considerable reform from that point on. You also talk about how these sacraments perform theological roles and social roles. What kind of social roles could these sacraments provide? Well, you know, there is really the, the gathering of believers together in worship, there is, you know, in really just functioning as the body of Christ. Um, so I don't know that the, I don't think the roles change. Um, sacraments continue to be critical to the life of the believer, even when Protestants limit the number of sacraments to two. And, you know, in fact, I would say it's interesting, you know, there's a lot of 
marriages, for example, were not really done in the context of the worship service. So it's kind of interesting to see Protestants demote marriage. It's no longer a sacrament, but then bring it into the Sunday worship service and bring, you know, make it very public. So there's kind of a, a fascinating dynamic there. Mm. But, you know, I, just in general, when communities were mixed mixed in terms of their confessions, whether Catholic or Protestant, that there's great complexity for those communities. Um, you know, there would be, for example, one of the, one, a well-known example that's often used to convey this has to do with the bell tower. So, you know, of course, the bell is, is calling people to church and to the marketplace and all of these things. And it's interesting how, you know, who, who has control over the bell tower for a community? Is it the, the Catholic Church or the Protestant Church? Um, this creates a lot of problems for the community um, in terms of holiday, you know, uh, what we would call today holiday, but like a feast day. Um, there, Protestants and Catholics are literally on different calendars um, as a result of calendar reform by the papacy. Uh, in the later 17th century. I mean, I think that's why I love the study of the early modern period and the Reformation. It's just so interesting to see how the church, the ch changes that happen to the church and the way that the church is so integrated into every aspect of human life, that those, ch those changes, and w what I would say is originally a theological change, it, it's so interconnected with politics and culture and society that, you know, it, it really does have a, a uh, extraordinary impact um, and an enduring impact as well. Yeah, I spoke with Brad Gregory earlier and <laughs> yes. kind of talked about religion as more than religion, trying to remind readers that yes. when you think about religion today, it's sort of this thing separate and away from all these other considerations. But like you said, it, it was really interwoven into every aspect of someone's life at the time. That's right. Yes, exactly. I think when we think about the Reformation period, we, we really need to appreciate and respect <laughs> the decisions that people were making at this time because, you know, when we think, well, okay, a third, it's estimated that a third of the population um, leaves the Roman Catholic Church for Protestantism. That was not an easy decision. Um, they are, you know, leaving family members behind and property and rank and even their life. That's from the Protestant context. And of course, Catholics face persecution in Protestant countries as well. So it, it, can, it goes both ways. But um, so there has to be there are social and political reasons to make your choice, whatever that is. But I think a conviction is also, you know, a factor that, that sometimes is, is too often underappreciated. <laughs> In addition to that, the idea that messing with the sacraments or trying to adjust sacraments or arguing over how many sacraments there should be, this was a, a really big deal. This, this could yes. in some cases be life or death. I'm thinking, for example, of the Anabaptists. Right. Yes, exactly. That's exactly right. That's a very radical thing to... I mean, I think what's happening with the Anabaptists is that they are really taking the idea of the priesthood of all believers really to its logical conclusion, perhaps. And, um, you know, well, then I can be a function as a priest in terms of sacraments, you know, and I can baptize my neighbor. Um, and they so, should too, right? Because the idea was that infant baptism... Yeah, it's didn't, invalid. Didn't cut it, yeah, because that's no, right. Making a conscious choice, so they're going to rebaptize people as though that's the first baptism. That's exactly right. They are looking at scripture, and they are not finding an affirmation for infant baptism in scripture, and that that's really the core of what is motivating them. So, scripture as the supreme authority is motivating them, and this uh, just uh, extraordinary sacrifices, um, just just terrible ones. Uh, unfortunately so and it goes to show the disagreement between reformers as well because martin luther also didn't care for the anabaptists and in fact it was maybe somewhat complicit in some of the executions that happened there or at least thought that they were huh, something like okay like yeah that makes sense to execute that particular heretic no <laughs> i know you know it's a. Uh... It is. It's disappointing to see the way that Protestants, uh, like I, I call them mainline Protestants, uh, how they, uh, you know, how they treated divergence in their communities, 
And, you know, it goes to show how baptism was also so tied to political identity. And, you know, that this is, it's really a mark of your citizenship. Um, you know, it's, there's, there's all these other aspects of baptism in the 16th century that we don't necessarily think about at all. So it, it's really quite a foreign reaction. But I think perhaps the greatest critique would be, you know, against Luther would be that, I mean, he, d he did start off the Reformation saying that the sword has no place in transforming the heart. So, you know, so you already see that principle in place in Luther's own writings, and then it's going to be repeated by radicals like Sebastian Castellio um, in response to uh, execution of Servetus um, in Geneva. And so, but the, so the seeds are already there, but I, I think they're, they're so entangled with the political context. It's not anything out of the ordinary to say that heresy deserves capital punishment. I mean, that is simply Carolingian law um, of the land. So, so they are um, truly a product of their time in that regard. And I think today, as we live in context of religious pluralism um, and secularization, we, um, you know, we lament that response, the way that heresy is, uh, you know, too linked to the political punishment. Teaching at Wheaton, you it's a, it's a Christian school. You encounter a lot of Christians, and when they learn about these parts of, of Reformation history, is there a lot of discomfort that you see? Do you have to have certain conversations with students who learn about some of these shadier aspects of history to have to reckon with, or is it far enough away now that, they, that it's not that big of a deal? You know, it is a big deal. So yes, Wheaton College is a is a Christian. It's a Protestant college. Um, it is broadly Protestant, so there's no denominational affiliation. So the faculty is all Protestant, but the students come from very diverse Christian backgrounds. We have Roman Catholic students and Eastern Orthodox students, and the majority of is still Protestant, but um, they're coming from diverse backgrounds. And it's often my undergraduate students who've never come, who maybe never heard church history taught in their churches. That's part of the problem. And so they are, they really struggle with it. I like to talk a lot about how, you know, um, that the church is, is really two things. The church is, is contextual and it is in time and space and place and it can't get away from that reality that is actually it's it's calling is to be in time and place and space and to um, but it has this calling to proclaim a universal message of of jesus christ and that uh so that's that's a tension because it's it's always facing you know how do we proclaim this to all people in all places you know according to matthew 28 and the great commission but yet we're in a particular context and it needs to be understood in that in that place and the fact is that that sin is real and <laughs> the church is not perfect and the story can be pretty messy but nonetheless there's also there's also grace and wisdom and there's also goodness and god is also at work in those things so uh yeah so sorting through that it can be complex but but i hope it gives students good perspective for today because as as believers in their different christian traditions you know they they recognize that the church sins today <laughs> yeah. so um that's yeah. an interesting concept the idea that the church sins do they think of it do you think of it in terms of institutionally is there institutional repentance that can happen as a result of that Absolutely. or how is that sin reckoned with yeah uh, well uh, not very well sometimes or maybe <laughs> lots of times but um yeah i think it's pretty neat so sometimes we can be so down on the church that we are not talking about the good things that the church is doing or has done in the past um i also taught at the university of st andrews when i was a doctoral student and you know those students were not coming in with the perspective of the church does good things whereas wheaton students come in with the perspective of the church does good things they were coming in with a more critical perspective of the church and so it's kind of like you're teaching 
trying to teach the opposite. You're trying to say like to those students, no, you know, the church did do good things. Uh, you know, things that you would consider good, I guess, uh, like education and hospitals and, you know, all these things. Um, caring for the poor. Caring for the poor. Yes, exactly. And the church has always attended to those things throughout its history. But then, yeah, and then in the Wheaton context, it's, you know, the church is not perfect. and <laughs> It has its failures. So um, you got to know your audience. But um, yeah, so I guess I'm challenging and, and pushing my students in, the, in those ways. Do you feel like there are institutional but pressures I, related to that in terms of like what, those two different contexts you've taught in? Oh, are there yeah. also expectations about, you know, there are lines that professors at Wheaton, for example, wouldn't cross. And, you know, the same as at a lot of these schools, Brigham Young University has different points that are yeah. non-negotiable and that sort of thing. I, I see. Yeah, I, I hear what you're asking. Um, I think, you know, yes, we, there is, we have a statement of faith and we do sign that statement of faith. But I would say that, um, I mean, I've been here 10 years now and, you know, the perceptions of Wheaton can really vary. It depends on, you know, if you're thinking this, from more conservative contexts, Wheaton's not conservative enough. And from more liberal contexts, Wheaton is not liberal enough. And so it, it's, it doesn't always fit perfectly uh, in, in either category. Um, but, you know, knowing the colleagues that I know here um, and the things that they're writing and publishing and when we talk about teaching, because Wheaton really cares about teaching, uh, I, I just love the freedom that we have in the classroom. The goal is is really to teach our students to be good thinkers and to think about the complexity. I mean, that's really what higher education is for, right? Is not the simplicity, <laughs> but to get beyond the simplicity and to think with greater complexity. And of course, it's a liberal arts institution, so it values the... Um, the learning that we can gain and garner from from every really every field of study um so there's no no field that should be silenced no voice that should be silenced um it should be engaged and that, that's been my experience of the school so <laughs> do you find yourself ever having to like arbitrate between disagreements of students because you have students from some different backgrounds religiously and so they're going to bring some different points of doctrine to the table that they might have differences of opinion over do you find that coming out in the classroom at all as people are negotiating not just their education but also their religious identities in the classroom yeah i think um it's important for the professor to set the tone so one of the objectives that we have in our class is that we will listen empathetically to the people of the past as well as to the people in, in our class, um, to those that we're reading. And also like with a, an attitude, I think it's really important as scholars to hold an attitude of humility, <laughs> which is yeah. too often lacking in the, in the field. And, you know, certainly not one that I'm perfect at either, but I think, you know, to orient ourselves towards that, that humility and then to, to understand, but, but to think critically at the same time. So um, you know, these are the ideals, of course, uh, it doesn't always work out, but, um, but, you know, this is what, uh, uh, this is what I try to teach my students because, you know, we, we will also grow in our thinking and as we learn more, um, there's growth there, there's a deepening, um, there's a broadening, uh, and perhaps, and then, you know, it's, it's also prayerful. So we, practice integration of faith and learning so that that usually means that I'll lead a devotional at the beginning of class that engages with material somehow that we begin with prayer and those things set the I think set the tone for the conversation. Hmm. That's Jennifer Powell McNutt. We're talking with her about her most recent book, which she co-edited with David Lauber, it's the People's Book, The Reformation in the Bible. And we're also talking with her about teaching at Wheaton College as well. And I wanted to explore that a little bit more with you as well. There's a phenomenon right now in uh, in the LDS church of this idea of faith crisis. And it's where uh, young people are confronting new facts and information about their religion that are unfamiliar, that unsettling. And with Reformation history, Mormons have been either ignorant of it entirely or okay. they don't feel any obligation toward it. So, if they, <laughs> you know, if they see something bad happening, you just say, oh, well, you know, that's not us. We don't have to worry about that. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, but, but it seems like there really are some parallels there, though, with, with mm. students sort of 
confronting something difficult about their religious background and coming to terms with it. And yeah, I've seen people, people end up leaving the faith. People end up taking okay. paths and stuff. Do you see that at, at Wheaton as well? Are people confronting things in that same way? You know, I, I do think that there is definitely students are, are exploring their, their faith. They are, you know, some of them are experiencing what you're saying, faith crisis. Um, I, I don't think it's, um, you know, it's, it's not always something that they want people to know about, yeah. um, but we do know that it's happening. And one of the reasons that we know is, is, is really because of how many students go to counseling now, um, you know, and that's across the board, I guess, nationally, um, the kind of anxiety that uh, students today are facing in in, uh, in undergraduate education. Yeah. Um, I, I primarily teach graduate students and they are married and often with children and, and even jobs. So, uh, so it's interesting to me because I'm getting them, you know, they've, they've kind of gone through that already. Mm-hmm. They've gone through the, the thinking through their faith. They've intentionally chosen to do a master's degree at Wheaton, knowing that there will be integration of faith and learning, knowing right. that, that we're going to think about academics, um, not just in terms of rigor, but also vocationally. And um, so, so there's, so there's that facet, but um, I like to, for the undergraduate, I, I do like to highlight these, you know, in, in sort of combating that as dominating the story. It is part of the story. It must be reckoned with. The hmm. sin is real, but um but that's not the only story. Um, there is, uh, you know, there is reconciliation. There is friendship. Um, I recently wrote a piece for Christianity Day, their January issue, on um, the Reformation, uh, <laughs> starting the, the big anniversary. Yes, yep, five hundred years. Uh, that's right. And I talked about denominationalism. But one of the stories that I pulled out from the Reformation context was the Marburg Colloquy. So in 1529, uh, Zwingli and Luther meet at Marburg, and um, with many others as well. <laughs> they usually are the only ones that people talk about, but yeah. there are many others there too. And, um, you know, and this is their first time to meet in person. And there, there are many different accounts of that encounter. And too often, the way that if you look, read like a, a basic textbook or whatever, too often the way that that encounter is described is, is really one of an antagonism. And so I'm, I'm going back through the testimony of that exchange and that interaction. And there are all kinds of other moments that are going on there of extending hand of friendship of, you know, well, we don't agree on this exactly, but that doesn't mean we can't have fellowship together. That's something that Luther says to Zwingli. And so sometimes we can to sort of shift the story over to these, what we, I guess, would consider these negative moments, these irreconcilable moments when there are also other moments <laughs> happening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I guess for today, that would be, you know, when it's, it's pretty, pretty interesting and, and exciting to see how Protestant denominations today are engaging with the Roman Catholic Church and how they're talking about things like justification, how, you know, the Pope is adopted this, this liturgy for the anniversary. Um, you know, there's, it's not really, um, there's a, a real exchange that's that's happening right now, and I think that's something to to value and appreciate as well. For your own self personally, then it seems like you have a way of talking about these difficult issues. Did you have to make a transition in in your own personal faith in order to reach that understanding, or was that something that was already sort of built in as you throughout your life as a Christian? <laughs> yes. Um, well, I had a, a pretty extraordinary upbringing, so. I, both of my parents were ordained Presbyterian pastors. <laughs> oh, okay. So I didn't grow up in a typical, typical Christian home. And that way I am what you would call a double PK. So that's pastor's kid. <laughs> you don't come, uh, come across many double PKs. You get <laughs> yeah. maybe one, but not both. So, you know, so because of that, because both of my parents not only had seminary training, they, they met at Fuller Seminary, but also because 
because they both had doctorates too. Um, our, you know, kitchen table conversation was not your average <laughs> kitchen table conversation. Yeah. <laughs> um, and my, my father, especially I would say has a real love of, of history of church history. And so, you know, the vacations that we took were to see churches all around mm-hmm. the world. And so I, it was never a problem for me. Um, it was just part of my own formation really yeah. from, from the very beginning. Well, the circle back around to kind of how we started out, we were talking about the sacraments in your chapter mm. on that. And, and as we're kind of wind down here, I wanted to talk about one other point that you raise, which is that in the context of Protestant worship, the word or the Bible gained a level of prominence that the sacraments had previously held. The Bible came to hold the same type of place in Protestant culture that the sacraments held in, in Catholic culture. And I wanted to hear a little bit more about that. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting if you look at woodcuts in the 16th century. Um, woodcuts, very simple, very diffusive images that were prevalent in the books of the time and pamphlets, and you know, very easy to to make. And there are a lot of woodcuts that depict the preaching moment. Um, what used to be, you know, primarily sort of focused on the 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 altar i'll say that word um there you know many protestants push against especially in their form tradition against the use of that particular word so they, they would say the table because it signifies like a sacrifice and they'd say yeah. sacrifice is done away so that's right an altar, yeah yeah exactly so it's interesting to see how the rhetoric has to shift when the theology yeah. shifts um you know of course the theology is undergirding all of these practices too so anyway so getting back to, i i i think that's fascinating to look at and even some of the woodcuts will show um there's one in particular i'm thinking of uh, but you know and it shows this the baptism and communion are happening on the two sides but then the pulpit you know is right there in the center and it, it's prominent it's de- yeah. been depicted as as bigger you know it feels closer uh when you're looking at the image and meanwhile these these other images of the sacraments are are in the background they're happening they're affirmed um they're part of the worship life of the church but the proclamation of the word through preaching and through the reading of scripture out loud is, you know, is really a focal point. Um, eventually churches, now this is not going to happen overnight because <laughs> one day you're a Catholic church and the next day you're a Protestant church, you know, the architecture doesn't really change. <laughs> um, but, you know, eventually as Protestants are building churches, they will make, you know, the pulpit more of a a prominent place that orients the way that that congregants are interacting in the worship context. And I'll just say too, you know, the the uh, you know scripture then is is also sung. You know, it's not just preaching, um, and it's not just reading the Bible out loud, but it's also singing scripture, involving congregants in the singing of scripture is really a a huge transformation to worship life. And in fact, there's lots of accounts that indicate that they sounded pretty bad. (laughs) 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 They they weren't used to singing. (laughs) Another unique thing about your essay in this book too, that I caught my eye was how, how you use French Bibles as evidence. These Bibles that were created in France, right? So you're examining the physical copies of these Bibles for clues about what Protestants believe. Like what does a physical book say? about the people who made it. Yes, that's exactly right. Thank you. Um, Yeah, that is actually my my research project right now. I've been conducting archival research throughout Europe and in the United States. I'm just trying to look at as many French Bibles as I can, and I'm just absolutely loving it. Yes, I'm very interested in the story of the French Bible. My, my work is on the Reformed tradition, Geneva, from the Reformation, um, and actually through the Enlightenment is the time period that I cover in my work. And I'm interested in the fact that there's really no authorized French Bible. So in contrast with the English Bible story um, of Henry VIII and all this, there's, you know, there isn't that story for the French Bible. I'm interested in, of course, you know, the Huguenots, they experienced considerable persecution over 
really what lasts for three centuries and different different consistency and and so different periods and um and then also they're they're scattering uh throughout really throughout the world um as well and you know how do they form continuity how do they create cohesion and you know one of the well, it's been studied quite a bit that one of the ways that they've done that was through inviting clergy that had trained at the university of geneva geneva academy um, calvin's academy to come and, and be a pastor at their church but i'm interested in how the bible functions in that way um as well even like the physical book itself like what does a mm -hmm. what does a cover say about a book what does that's how right words are placed on the page and what kind of things are you pulling out of that what kind of conclusions can you reach based on looking at this almost like a detective looking at a <laughs> piece of evidence that was left at the scene yeah it's it's well it has been very fun to explore i mean basically I mean, we would say it's an artifact, but it, of course, it's so much more than that because it's a lifeline for these Christian communities. And you know, so for example, I, I might I look at you know things like the prefatory material. So how is the reader being prepared to engage with scripture? Um, a paper that I gave at Bruges at the 16th Century Studies Conference just this last year. Um, was was tracing the prefatory materials and something i discovered for example was that john calvin has a huge role in um shaping the early french uh french bible and he writes some prefaces for the bible and um you know there's there's a real push in calvin studies right now to say that you know calvin doesn't really have as great of an influence as we thought and that you know that certainly dissipates over time so for me it's it's fascinating to discover that calvin's prefaces are continuing to be published in french bibles into the 18th century which is an indication of how these bibles were passing on a rootedness in that Genevan Reformation. So that's a fascinating aspect to me, but also just then how the Bibles themselves circulate to different contexts um, all throughout Europe, how they adapt to, to different contexts. Um, there's, there's one Bible that I'm interested in in the Netherlands that is using the French text um, so again, the, the lineage can be complex, but from French Bibles that, that go back to the Geneva French Bible. But then because they're in this Flemish context, they've actually in the margins where they're interpreting the scriptural passages, they're using Flemish Bible marginalia. So in a way you have this French speaking community that's then able to engage with its context uh, in interpreting scripture and it isn't alienated from its community in how scripture is being assessed. It's a fascinating chapter in that book. The chapter is called Word and Sacrament, and people can read that in the book that you edited, The People's Book, The Reformation and the Bible. That's Jennifer Powell McNutt. Thanks for taking the time to talk to us today, Jennifer. It was so fun. Thank you so much, Blair. I appreciate it.